Hey everyone, it's Tech Tuesday. Today I'm going to be talking about satellite broadband and not the satellite broadband you may be used to or have heard about, but this is something totally different. I'll be right back. Hey, I'm Rick Uzi, Vice President of Marketing here at Zcorum, and again, it's Tech Tuesday. Welcome. So again, I'm going to be talking about satellite broadband today. Uh, Last week I talked about what Cable Labs is doing uh, on the cable side of things with their 10G initiative and before that I talked about what's happening with 5G. This is all kind of a series on what we might expect in 2020 or just in general with moving forward with broadband. So today again we're talking about satellite broadband and uh, there's actually quite a few changes that are coming up with this. Um, it's going to be a little different than what you see here. So normally we're used to satellite broadband or you know, same thing as TV, let's say, over a satellite. Uh, you have a dish on your house and uh, it looks kind of like that. It's a parabolic dish that's aimed at a satellite, um, a satellite that's going to be generally in geostationary orbit. And this is going to be quite different on what we're going to be seeing here in, in 2020. And it's actually uh, SpaceX that's kind of leading the way here. There's other companies that have announced it and have been talking about doing it, but SpaceX, you know how they are, uh, or I should say Elon Musk with Tesla and SpaceX, uh, he doesn't sit around, he actually goes out and immediately starts doing stuff. And he's he's been doing that with obviously his, uh, with SpaceX, with launching uh, satellites for other folks. Uh, you know what he's talking about, going to Mars, that kind of thing. So he's ahead of the curve and he's definitely ahead of the curve on this. So um, what you're looking at here is uh, what how they're launching these things. So they launch uh, a batch of 60 satellites at a time when they're doing this and they're in this array here and then they kind of deploy one at a time and then they have ion thrusters, it sounds very Star Trek-y, that uh, will then get them into the proper orbit over time. So they uh, again launched 60 at a time. They started back in May of last year I think and now they actually have 180 satellites in orbit. They, they launched 60 this, this month. So 180 satellites in orbit, that's out of 22 or 2300 active satellites that are in orbit that they already now have 160 of them in there. So um, they're already a big player. In fact, the, the biggest operator of satellites now just in the course of less than a year for them. So um, they expect to be offering their Starlink internet service by mid this year, mid 2020. Uh, in certain areas of the United States. They need five or six more launches maybe to get to that to the number of satellites in order to do that. Um, they're hoping for 24 launches this year, which will give them pretty, you know, some global coverage. And then everything after that, from what I hear, is going to be bandwidth or capacity. So uh, they'll be offering limited service globally, possibly as early as early next year. They have uh, approval for 12,000 satellites from uh, from the government authorities, and now they're asking for 30,000. So that may become an issue. They do have approval for 12,000, but there are some challenges with that many satellites in space, and some people are not very happy. We'll get into that here in a minute. Um, so how does it all work? These satellites are. This is a, this is what one looks like here, um, and it's got it's about the size of a table, and then it's got a solar array on it, and this would be just one satellite out of these 180 now that are in orbit. Um, and here you can see again, kind of from their website, a, a picture of what two of them might look like in orbit. So these are low Earth orbit at about 340 miles. So that doesn't sound that low. 340 miles sounds like a long way up. But if you consider a geostationary satellite, um, geostationary satellites are generally at about 22,000 miles. And these satellites at 340 miles, you can see that there's a big difference on uh, the, the distance of these. So um, what that means as in terms of latency or trip time on those geostationary satellites, it's about 600 milliseconds of time that it takes to get from the ground up to the satellite and satellite back to the ground. And uh, with these Starlink satellites, it's going to be about 25 milliseconds, which is comparable to a lot of wireline connections, what let's say cable is doing today in their, their current setup. Um, so what's the market? Uh, I think the market to start out with is going to be very similar to, or a big part of it is going to be very similar to what we see with satellite today with these geostationary 
satellites, and that would be remote locations, you know, people that can't really be reached very effectively with a wireline connection or a, a wireless connection. There's no towers or there's not line of sight, whatever you might need, and, and very hard to get cable or fiber there. So those people don't have a lot of options, and they're happy to pay for internet service if they can get it from a satellite provider, even though the, the lag time is, is quite a bit and you don't have quite the speeds that you might get with a wired connection. So you're looking at, again, remote rural locations, cruise ships, airplanes. Um, you know, to give you an example, uh, the speed uh, for the Starlink is ex expected to be, or what they're trying to get is one gigabit per second. And they actually did a test with the military to a turboprop air airplane and got 610, 610 megabits per second on that plane. So uh, that's another you know, military kind of uh, application. It's another thing that they'll be doing. And then also uh, long haul kinds of things. So uh, you know, you've got fiber, for example, now running under the ocean. And fiber generally has low latency. Um, but the longer you stretch that fiber, the longer the latency is going to be. But here with these satellites, it could be that it's expected that they'll be able to transmit data, let's say, from uh, across the Atlantic, from the United States to Europe and back again, much faster than you would get over fiber because the, you've got just the space, basically, that you're going through. And there's not a lot of latency in a vacuum. And you know, so you can look at sending up to a satellite, across to another one, and over to Europe, and then down again, and maybe do that much more effectively than you might through fiber. So that's another market for them. Uh, now, one of the things that's helping out is that um, launch costs have really dropped quite a bit uh, in the last 10 years or so. Believe it or not, five to 10 times in just the last 10 years, since around 2000, that the costs have come down. You can see why that would be. Again, um, low Earth orbit helps, so having these not go quite as high is going to help you reduce your costs. And then SpaceX, their own, their own launch company. So, um, you know, it costs them money to do this, but it's their money. They're not having to pay another company to launch satellites for them. So that certainly helps. And also, what you're looking at here, this is actually a, um, a booster vehicle landing on a drone ship. So this is not taking off here. This was a booster ve vehicle that had been used before, or at least maybe in this case, I don't know if it was, but it's a, it's a booster that's landing on a drone ship. And then they can reuse this again. In fact, this last launch that they did this month of those 60 satellites, they had used that booster three other times. They used it to launch a Telstar satellite for one of their commercial deployments. They also Iridium, they launched an Iridium satellite, another competitor of theirs. And then uh, they launched their first Starlink mission on that booster back in May. So they're trying to get as many uses out of these boosters as they can to save money on that. It's still going to be expensive. Um, it's still expensive, obviously, to get all these satellites up there. The estimated cost is going to be $10 billion. That's a lot of money. But um, Elon Musk says that he can make 30 to $50 billion a year. That remains to be seen uh, if he can do that, again, with a um, somewhat limited market, because I don't know about a market in urban and suburban areas, but uh, that's what he's thinking he, he can do. Now, in addition to the, the cost of launching these satellites the first time, the lifespan is expected to only be like five years. So they're going to be churning through these things, almost like rotating them every five years as they launch satellites. They're going to be having to be prepared to maintain or replace those over time. So again, still going to be kind of costly. Um, now, how much is it going to cost the consumer? Um, the thought is about $80 a month. One of the reasons that people are coming up with that number is because it was either Elon Musk or one of his folks made the statement that a lot of people are paying $80 for really crappy internet service. So the thought there is that we can do a lot better uh, and they can pay us that amount instead of somebody else for internet that's not nearly as fast and that's got that lag time, that delay. What's the CP going to look like? Um, so people were wondering, and this month, just a few weeks ago, Elon Musk, somebody asked him the question, he said, well, it's going to look like a thin, flat, round UFO on a stick. He says the Starlink terminal has motors to self-adjust the optimal angle to, uh, to view the sky. So basically he's saying the instructions are really simple. Just plug it in, point it at the sky, and you're done. No training required. So some people are speculating, does that mean it's going to have physical motors that's going to that are going to have to track these satellites? And I don't, that, that's, as far as I know, that's not what he's talking about. But what it does is it makes it a lot easier for installation. So again, if somebody puts this, and I don't know if they're going to be able to 
put it in their home and point it at a window that can see the sky somewhere, or if it's going to have to be outside, mounted outside, and then wire is going to have to run through the home. I'm thinking it may be a window will work. Uh, if he's saying just point it at the sky, he's not talking about um, having to run wire through your walls or anything like that. I guess we'll see. Uh, but I think what the motor is going to do is once you point it at the sky, it's then going to be able to find the optimal angle to then be able to view all these satellites. It's not going to have to be moving around all the time. It's probably going to find that one time. I guess there could be minor adjustments, but just one time, and then it may be that it's done and it's basically installed at that point. And the reason for that, um, uh, here's just uh, an analogy of how these radio waves are going to propagate. So an omnidirectional antenna, this is, this is kind of an analogy of that, a drop of water where you've got, the, uh, you've got things radiating out in a circle. So it's not focused in any one area. Uh, what, the, um, what the Starlink uh, CPE is going to look like and what it's going to have is a phased array antenna. And that's going to actually be closer to, if you have two drops, this would be what it looks like if you have two drops in water. What happens is the waves actually interfere with each other which sounds like a bad thing, but actually what it does, and you can't really see it in so much in this uh, little GIF here, but uh, what happens is as those waves on the sides interfere with each other, it actually makes a narrow beam in the center. So it's almost like aiming the antenna when you have a couple of uh, antennas shooting off and then the waves interfere with each other, and then you've got kind of a beam in the middle. And the more, the more antennas you put, the more narrow that beam can get. So well, that's great. So you've got this one beam going down the center perpendicular to where these antennas are, but then how do you aim them? Well, that's kind of the cool thing is with this phased array antenna, and this is a, this is a little animated uh, example that's up on Wikipedia if you look that up. So basically, the way that you then aim that beam is you just um, change the timing on the antennas of when they're sending their signals. So they're all sending the same signal, but um, you change the timing slightly for each antenna, and then that starts to shift that beam at different angles as you change the timing. So this, this equipment's going to have that built into it so that they're automatically going to be shifting that main wave to follow the satellites as needed. So that's why it's going to be a fairly small antenna, they say about like pizza size, small, small to medium sized pizza, UFO on a stick, aim it. The motor will put it in the optimal position, and then this phased array and the phased array antenna is inside through this electronic adjustment of adjusting the signal between the, the array of antennas will then point that beam at the satellites. So that's how that's going to work. Uh, there are some concerns, uh, and we may be hearing about this more in 2020. People have already been raising a stink about it, but there are concerns about all these satellites going up there, and you can imagine, um, you know, just. Again, they're talking about having 10,000 to 12,000 to 30,000 of these things up in the sky. So what is that going to do? Um, one, of the, one of the groups that are upset are astronomers because you've got all of these satellites up there that are suddenly interfering with them trying to see the skies and see the stars. And here's an example of uh, a, an exposure that was taken showing the streaks across the sky as the satellites went by, as this uh, array of satellites went through the sky. The astronomers took that. And then um, I'll show you also here, this is a, a little time-lapse video of the same, kind of the same thing, but you can see these satellites. You know, this is an observatory. You can see these satellites uh, streaking through the sky there. So you can see why they're not real happy about that. Uh, the other issue that you have would be space junk. So you've got all of this stuff up there. So suddenly, you know, you would think if you had that many satellites, you know, could you actually launch anything through that big cloud of satellites? Well, space is big. There's lots of space up in space. So there is going to be a lot of room up there, but there's still the opportunity for collisions as all of these satellites are circling the Earth as they're orbiting the Earth. Um, so obviously if there's a collision, uh, you've got those two satellites that are going to be out of commission that collide, but then also that creates debris. And that debris is suddenly a projectile that can then take out other satellites because you can't control that. So there's concerns about that. And the way that's handled today is that the companies that manage these satellites have to uh, deal with um, the Combined Space Operations Center, or CSPOC, with Long and Prosper, CSPOC. Um, so 
this agency, this government agency, keeps track of satellites, and then the satellite companies uh, report to them where their satellites are positioned. And then CSPOC, if they see that there's a potential collision, and believe it or not, the if the odds are one in ten thousand that there's going to be a collision, then they want the satellite company to start doing things and start moving stuff around. Uh, so they will contact the satellite company, and the satellite company will take uh, initiative to move their satellite and thrusters or whatever they have to do to to get those collisions to not happen. Uh, the way that um, what what SpaceX is saying they're going to do with the Starlink satellites is they have an autonomous collision avoidance system. Sounds like a Tesla car, right? So maybe that technology is coming from that. So they will, um, if they if they sense that there's going to be some kind of a collision, then they will go ahead and automatically adjust their orbit, and then they will report back to CSPOC the changes. So they're saying that they don't have to even get any human beings involved to do this, that the satellites will automatically do this, they'll report the data back to CSPOC, and, and everything will be good. So we'll see how that works. So they're, they're taking... Um, steps to address that proactively, and obviously they need to with the number of satellites they're going to have in space there. So uh, obviously space, SpaceX is at the forefront of this. There are other companies that are doing it, including Amazon. Amazon always wants to get involved in everything, it seems like, and they're involved in this. So they have their project, Kuiper, which uh, they have been talking about, not launched yet, but they're still moving forward. They just put, uh, I think, in just set up a permanent R&D headquarters to be able to create these satellites. So they're at that point. So again, they're quite a bit behind SpaceX, but they do have their R&D headquarters set up, and they, they say they're eventually going to have 3,200 satellites in orbit. You've got OneWeb. They've already launched some satellites, although quite you know not nearly as many as uh, SpaceX already has. Uh, they expect to have 650 satellites at, at some point. And then you've got Telsat, who's been in the business a really long time, and they're now talking about their own mega constellation that they're going to have, and they're talking about 292 satellites. They're not talking about beginning service until 2022. So I think that's, that's going to be an issue for these other companies that are trying to get in there. How do you compete with SpaceX um, as quickly as they're launching these satellites? Again, by the end of this year, having, I think, 1,400 in space, and then they're planning on doing launches almost every month, maybe maybe more multiple launches a month as they launch 60 at a time. So uh, they're obviously at the forefront of this. What's you know what remains to be seen is how easy is the CPE going to be to install? Really, do you have to um, mount it on the out in the outside somewhere and get the signal into the house? Um, are they, you know, what markets are they going after? Are they going to try to go after uh, more suburban and urban markets? I don't think so, at least in the beginning, because uh, kind of like I was talking about when I was talking about 5G, uh, if you already have good internet service somewhere, like most people do in, in suburbs and urban areas, you've got at least one internet provider, so they're competing, and you've usually got really high speed, and your latency is going to be about the same as this. Uh, and might even be better if you have millimeter wave 5G. It's going to be one one millisecond or so. And if you've got low doxis or low dent, excuse me, um, low latency doxis, then you're also talking about one to two milliseconds as they they start to get that into play. So I don't think there's going to be uh, many people that are going to sign up for this in other areas. The difference could be obviously I don't you know if Elon Musk is charging eighty dollars a month to somebody on the top of a mountain or somebody that's in the middle of a desert. That's a great deal. It's not a great deal in an urban area, but does maybe he has two different price, price plans depending on demand. Maybe he decides to charge a lot less and maybe lose money in the short term uh, in urban areas. I don't know. Uh, seems like it would be hard to do, but it would be kind of nice if you think about it. If this, if you could get internet wherever you are, if you're traveling somewhere, you don't need to. You need, got your internet and get it on your phone. Maybe, maybe it'll work on your phone. I don't know. So we'll have to see if it really does play in the urban or suburban markets. At this point, I don't think wireline providers have much to worry about. Uh, maybe if they're serving a rural area and they're not doing a very good job, or um, I guess at some point if, if SpaceX decides to, to mark that area, there could be a challenge. But I, I just don't see that happening again because you know they've got you kind of got an entrenched service right there. 
The, the ones that really ought to worry are would be your satellite providers that are doing it now. Somebody like uh, Viasat, for example, that's providing satellite internet, HughesNet, providing satellite internet, and they've got these geostationary satellites up there with, you know, they don't get nearly the speed that you're going to be able to get off of Starlink, and the, the latency is going to be much lower with Starlink. So I think those are the folks that are probably worrying right now. And we saw where Telsat is planning on launching their own, although, again, they're kind of behind already in that. So... So that's what's coming up. Again, 2020, I guess we will see. Uh, coming up here mid-year, we may start to see advertisements for Starlink. We, there's some selective people in certain areas of the country can actually start to get it. That'll be interesting. And then maybe by the end of the year, we'll be seeing more of that. And who knows next year as they, as they keep launching these things 60 at a time. So uh, that's uh, what we're looking at at Satellite Broadband. Next week, I believe next week, I do believe it's next week, I'm going to be here with Marty. Marty Kukul, and we're going to be talking about um, coherent optics. So it's uh, we talk, I talked a little bit about that on the area of uh, 10G and, and DOCSIS um, last week. We were talking about how coherent optics is going to be used by cable labs to help improve the fiber service, the fiber portions of their HFC network. We're going to be diving more deeply into coherent optics next week with Marty when he's here. So I will see you then for Tech Tuesday. Take care.